On this edition for Saturday, March 23rd, the latest on the release of the Mueller report. Author Don Winslow on his book, The Border. How am I riding? I'm riding high. And a thriving jazz scene on the island nation of Haiti. Next on PBS NewsHour Weekend. From the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center in New York, Hari Srinivasan. Good evening and thanks for joining us. The contents are still secret. The attorney general is still reviewing and the demands to see special counsel Robert Mueller's report on the almost two year investigation into President Trump and Russian election interference are growing. Photographers track the movements of Attorney General William Barr as he left home this morning. Yesterday, in a letter to congressional leaders, Barr said he anticipated he might be, quote, in a position to advise you of the special counsel's principal conclusions as soon as this weekend. President Trump remained at his Mar-a-Lago estate in Florida, where he played golf. Democrats and Republicans held conference calls to consider strategies. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi issued a statement to her Democratic colleagues in advance of their call, asking that any briefings about the Mueller report be, quote, unclassified so that members can speak freely about every aspect of the report. For analysis and a look at what may be coming next, we turn to Ryan Goodman, a professor of law at New York University's School of Law and co-editor-in-chief of the online forum Just Security. We are kind of in this holding pattern right now, but <clears throat> is there anything that prevents this report and the sort of digested version from being public documents? Uh, there's nothing that prevents it by a matter of law. Um, so this really is the discretion of the attorney general. There might be some caveats there for classified information, but that's the only kind of real caveat. Otherwise, there's nothing barring him from being able to provide this to Congress and to the public. Given that there has been public interest, even deemed by a vote from the majority of the House to say, hey, make this public, right? I mean, is there a strong incentive then for Barr, for his own transparency interests to make sure that this all looks above board, to try to make more of it as public as possible? I think so. I think there's a, it's an important historical moment when he went up for his nomination. He, in fact, basically committed to the Senate that he would make it as transparent as possible, mm -hmm. consistent with the law. And since there's no real legal barrier, I think that's the position that he's in, and there's just kind of overwhelming support, it seems, in the country that the public really wants to know what has uh, happened here and what did Mueller find. So that central tension between transparency and making sure that people who are not indicted, who are mentioned, who have been investigated, uh, who have not been charged with any crimes, their privacy is protected, even though for the past couple of years we've also seen several staffers inside the Department of Justice have their kind of private texts and everything else splayed out, even though they haven't been charged with particular crimes. Right, so that's another concern, and that's a kind of a general concern that might come up in criminal prosecutions. And if somebody's deemed not to be indictable because there's not proof beyond a reasonable doubt that they committed the crime. But this is a different kind of a setting in the sense that Mueller is primarily given the mandate of a counterintelligence investigation to find out if there is derogatory information about people, were there Americans who helped the Russians interfere in the election? Mm -hmm. And then it's not really a response to say, yes, but because they didn't commit a crime, we can't know about it. You could easily see that the Justice Department would reach the view that in the public interest, they do need to reveal some of this information so that the public knows what exactly Mueller found. Maybe it's even exonerating. Uh, it actually says that there's good information, that people did not really yeah. go along with the Russians. So besides what the Department of Justice or what the special counsel finds today, is there a possibility here that this kicks some of these pieces of information down the road to, say, the Sun Southern District of New York or other jurisdictions that might have uh, interest in this? I think so. Uh, it's so difficult to know what's in that report and what exactly was in Mueller's mind when he decided to wrap up now. But I think a highly plausible explanation of all of this is he completed his encounter intelligence mandate, he finished his probe, that was the main object of, mm -hmm. he com and, then, and, and then he reports that to Congress or he reports that to the Attorney General. And then if there's anything left over in the criminal setting, he hands it off mm -hmm. to the Southern District of New York, to the DC Office of the Justice Department, as he's done with other parts of this investigation. This would be special because you'd actually be handing off parts that deal with the Russia element of it. So that would be new, mm -hmm. and that's why it's still difficult to tell uh, without knowing exactly what's in that report. Sure. 
know, there's the report, and then there's the kind of interpretation of that report and the public perception of that report, and it seems like it's a Rorschach test in, in America right now. If you're a supporter of the president, you know, the president has called this a witch hunt 180 plus times. He says this is, you know, completely a, a hoax in the first place. And then there's, of course, Democrats on the other side who've been really putting a lot of political eggs in this basket and saying, let's wait for this report, let's wait for this report, right? So regardless of what is actually published today, tomorrow, uh, this week, people are not that likely to have move uh, their kind of points of view on things. I think that might be right. It's just, it's a sorry state about our political affairs uh, in the sense that we might have very credible information coming from Mueller one way or the other, and the spin is going to happen in one direction or the other, or people already have their preconceived views in a certain sense about what happened in 2016 and what they think about this president. So I think it's going to be a really interesting and important moment for the country to see whether or not something like this can actually penetrate and change people's minds. All right, Ryan Goodman from NYU and the Just Security blog. Thanks so much. Thank you. For more on Special Counsel Robert Mueller's report, visit pbs.org slash newshour. The Federal Emergency Management Agency unnecessarily shared the personal data of more than two million disaster survivors with a government contractor. Individuals who shared information with FEMA from the California wildfires in 2017 and Hurricanes Harvey, Irma and Maria might now be at risk of fraud and identity theft. The sensitive personal information included the last four digits of Social Security numbers, addresses and banking information, according to a report from the Department of Homeland Security's Office of the Inspector General. FEMA says it has, quote, taken aggressive measures to correct this error and that it found no indication survivor data was compromised. It took a jury in Pittsburgh four hours to find a white former East Pittsburgh police officer not guilty of murder or manslaughter in the fatal shooting of an unarmed black teenager from last June. Outside the courthouse, protesters shouted Antoine Rose, the name of the 17-year-old who was shot and killed after a traffic stop. The former officer, Michael Rosfeld, said he pulled over a car that Rose was in because it matched the description of a car in a drive-by shooting. Rose was running from the car when Rosfeld shot him in the back, side, and face. A lawyer for Rose's family said they may challenge the verdict in Pennsylvania Supreme Court and on the federal level. Experts are warning that the flooding risk in the Midwest is far from over. As spring temperatures warm the region, snowmelt in northern states like Minnesota and North Dakota will send more water into the Mississippi and Missouri rivers. The Army Corps of Engineers is urging those living in affected zones to remain alert. Thousands have been forced to evacuate their homes and farms in Nebraska, Missouri and Iowa, and damage from the recent floods is estimated to be at least $3 billion. Last month, when novelist Don Winslow published The Border, the final novel in his best-selling trilogy about America's drug wars, the New York Times said it landed right on the culture's front burner. As much as anyone, Winslow has charted the decades-long link between the power of the drug cartels and the flood of immigrants seeking a new life, and between what the author considers failed policy and countless deaths and ruined lives. News Hour Weekend Special Correspondent Jeff Greenfield recently visited Don Winslow at his Southern California home, fittingly not far from the Mexican border. President Trump's most popular talking points in the last few weeks, the caravans of thousands of Central American migrants headed toward the U.S. southern border. It has dominated our political debate. Build that wall. Build that wall. Build that it helped elect a president. President Trump, you will not get your wall. It triggered a month-long government shutdown. Hey, hey, ho, ho, shut this, got to go. And the president has declared it a national emergency. Because we have an invasion of drugs, invasion of gangs, invasion of people. It is the toxic mix of Mexican drug cartels, unspeakable violence, caravans of asylum seekers, and a major domestic political fight. Just 40 miles from the San Diego-Tijuana border, in the mountain town of Julian, California, novelist Don Winslow has spent 20 years chronicling the story of the drug wars that have triggered so much of this controversy. The horrific violence as cartels battle for supremacy. The murder of hundreds of journalists and officials that has driven so many on a perilous search for safety. His new novel, The Border, now at the top of many bestseller lists, is the concluding work of a trilogy that was born out of a single two-decade-old news story. I remember the date, September 20th, 1998. 
I get up in the morning and my, the first thing I do every morning is I look at the newspapers. And that morning in the San Diego Union Tribune, there was a story about 19 innocent men, women, and children slaughtered in a town just across the border because it was thought by the local cartel that one of them was an informer. That story inspired Winslow to write 2005's The Power of the Dog, chronicling American efforts to battle the rise of a drug cartel led by a thinly fictionalized version of Joaquin Guzman, known better as El Chapo. Winslow thought that one book would be all, but the escalating violence and the escalating efforts by the United States to fight what it calls a drug war kept him returning to the story. He followed with the cartel in 2015, and now, with the border, Winslow has come to one stark conclusion. What is it about this drug war, about what's going on, that you think Americans most need to know and may not know? That it's not the Mexican drug problem, it's the American drug problem. We, we point our fingers, increasingly so, with this administration at Mexico. Oh, those criminals are coming up. Oh, those drugs are coming up. Yes. Why? Because we buy the drugs. If I were standing on the other side of that border, of that proposed wall, I might want to build a wall because something like $65 billion in drug money goes south across that wall to fund basically terrorist organizations that are destabilizing Mexican society, Mexican politics, and the Mexican economy. America's so-called war on drugs began almost 50 years ago, promoted by presidents from both parties. America's public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. Drugs are menacing our society. They're threatening our values and undercutting our institutions. We've had more major drug dealers arrested than in any previous uh, similar time in our history. For Winslow, much, most, of the efforts to fight this war, the rhetoric of presidents going back decades, the endless photo ops of drug seizures, even the recent conviction of cartel leader Guzman, El Chapo, have been exercises in futility. And all you have to do is look at the numbers. Since he was captured and recaptured or re-recaptured, the importation of drugs into America has not fallen, it's risen. The number of overdose deaths have not fallen, it's risen. And as for building a wall to stop the flow of drugs? If you read the DEA's last five annual threat assessment reports, it says right in there, what we all of us have always known, that 90% or more of the illicit drugs that come through the Mexican border come through POEs, points of entry. There are 52 of them on the Mexican-American border, but three that really matter. And most of the drugs come in tractor-trailer trucks right through those legal ports of entry. And it's at these three ports, San Diego, California, Laredo, Texas, and El Paso, Texas, through which an unstoppable flood of drugs flows into the United States every day. One every 15 seconds through El Paso, for instance. So about 5,000 a day through these ports of entry. So there's no way that you're going to stop and search those trucks unless you completely shut down commerce between the United States and Mexico, which you cannot do because you will wreck the economies of two countries. For Winslow, the whole notion that these travelers crossing the border pose the danger of violence is wrongheaded. In fact, he says most of these people are fleeing the violence of drug cartels, who often recruit children to act as drug mules on pain of death. And he took us to the mountains where many are abandoned by their guides to grapple with literally life-threatening weather. Looking down at the desert floor, the, the kind of bitter irony is that the immigrants get dropped off out there either coming across the mountains where they could freeze to death or right down there in the desert just a few miles where they die of heat exposure. Winslow's novels also paint a picture of powerful financial interests in the United States, banks, investment companies, that wittingly or not launder the drug profits. And after two decades immersed in this world, Winslow has emerged with a blunt, provocative answer to the question, what to do? Well, I'd legalize drugs. All of them? All of them control them, just let them free market, does it matter? Listen, I, I, uh, 
I'd like to see you know us talk about any of those possibilities. What I know right now is that what we're doing, treating it as a law enforcement problem or God help us a military problem, doesn't work. Every horror story you can tell me about heroin and cocaine and the meth and all of them, right? And I've seen them firsthand. Happens while they were illegal. Every one of them. So I think what we need to do is, yes, at least to criminalize, more emphasis on diversion programs, trying to get people treatment. But one thing we definitely want to do is take the profit out of these drugs because it's the profit that is funding violent sociopaths to the points of billions of dollars a year. Much of the news we hear from Haiti has to do with natural disasters and political crises. But of course, the society has much more than that. In fact, the island nation is also home to a vibrant and growing art scene. News Hour Weekend's Yvette Feliciano reports from the capital city of Port-au-Prince on one of that country's biggest cultural events, which attracts top musicians from around the globe. Life's great. Life's great. On a warm winter evening in Haiti, jazz singer Cécile McLaurin Salvant performs before a live audience at the 13th annual Port-au-Prince International Jazz Festival, or Pop Jazz. Somewhere there must be a place where two heartbeats can touch, where lovers can meet in the daylight and find it's enough. Salvant who won her third Grammy for Best Jazz Vocal Album in February, is American, but also has family in Haiti. Haiti is a strange, strange land for me. It is extremely familiar on the one hand, probably because of my ancestry, and yet I'm a total alien here. I'm a total tourist. <laughs> Performing at Pop Jazz gives Salvant the opportunity to connect with her Haitian roots in different ways, like visiting with students in the Haitian Education and Leadership Program. They favor her with some of the music they've been working on. And Salvant returns the favor. I want to get to know Haiti in a much deeper way. I want to re-familiarize myself with this place that is somehow back there somewhere, you know. For 33-year-old singer-songwriter Paul Bobron, pop jazz offers an opportunity to reconnect. Born and raised in Port-au-Prince, Bobron was sent to live in New York City when he was 17 because of political unrest in Haiti. How did that experience shape you as a young man and your relationship to Haiti? Yeah, in the beginning, it was hard, you know. I was, I was very depressed. Even though I have family, you know, I stayed with my aunts. I love New York. You know, those age like 17, 16, 17, 18, you like, you don't know who you are yet, you know. I wanted my country to raise me more, but it didn't happen that way. Since 2007, Pop Jazz has been bringing together artists from all over the world. This year, the festival hosted some two dozen musical acts from Haiti, the US, Europe, the Middle East, and Latin America. In addition to live concerts, the festival features musical workshops and traditional Haitian performances like rara, street music performed with horns and percussion. Pop Jazz founder Joel Widmeyer 
says the festival helps to showcase Haiti's contribution to world music, as well as his country's ability to host an international event. We try to, 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 to show the, the variety of the Haitian music. That's important to us. And we mix it with jazz. It's a music that embraces all, all, all culture. From Europe, it's very different from what they do in the States. It's a different sound, it's a different approach to the music, and uh, Latin jazz also. So uh, in one night, you can see three concerts, they're all different. L'escalier n'est pas dangereux. Cecile McLaurin Salvant notes that jazz itself has roots in Haitian music. After the Haitian Revolution ended in 1804, many free and enslaved Haitians ended up in New Orleans. A lot of people want to talk about like jazz was born in New Orleans, which is in some ways true, but it to me was born out of this particularly American fusion of all these different kinds of music. Haiti was a part of that. And then what is very interesting to me is these cycles of influence and then, you know, Haitian musicians then being influenced by jazz and by bebop later, um, you hear it in a lot of, a lot of uh, Haitian music. Paul Bobron says he feels those influences throughout his own work. For me, it's natural to play blues, jazz, it's natural to play reggae, it's natural to play soul, R&B. If you hear them, they're not that different. They are sisters and brothers, you know, um, same mother. So they are all one family. Bobron hopes that pop jazz will put Haiti on more people's musical map. What are you hoping visitors from outside of the country will get from the Jazz Fest? I hope they become Haiti's ambassadors. You can see a whole different side of it and, and the beauty, the people. This is PBS NewsHour Weekend, Saturday. U.S.-backed forces in Syria claimed military victory over ISIS today, one day after the Trump administration announced the end of fighting there. Commanders of the Syrian Democratic Forces planted their flag above the town of Baghouz and showed reporters the aftermath of weeks of fighting there. At a ceremony at the nearby Al Omar field base, a senior State Department official said the territorial defeat is a, quote, critical milestone, but he also said ISIS remains a threat. An international rescue mission is underway in southern Africa, where hundreds have died and tens of thousands are stranded after a cyclone devastated parts of Mozambique, Zimbabwe and Malawi. The storm, which first hit the port city of Beira, Mozambique, on March 14th, before moving inland, destroyed homes, damaged roads and bridges, and knocked out power and communications. Members of Indian and South African military forces are joining aid groups searching for survivors and trying to deliver food and supplies across the still-flooded region. Hundreds of thousands of protesters marched in London today, demanding a second referendum on Brexit, Britain's 2016 vote to leave the European Union. London's Mayor Sadiq Khan joined the march, telling reporters that the only way to unite Britain is for the people to have the final say on Brexit. Britain was scheduled to leave the EU on March 29th. European Union negotiators agreed to a complicated extension that may give Prime Minister Theresa May until April 12th to come up with a deal. For the 19th straight weekend, yellow vest demonstrators gathered in Paris and other French cities today. But this time, the military was called on to assist the police and protect property. The marchers were banned from the Champs-Élysées in Paris and central neighborhoods in several other cities. Thousands gathered in a southern section of Paris today to again protest President Emmanuel Macron's economic policies. Last weekend, the demonstrations turned violent in Paris, where several fires were set and windows were smashed, leading to the new restrictions. Join us again tomorrow for the latest on the Attorney General's continuing review and possible release of information from the Mueller report. That's all for this edition of PBS NewsHour Weekend. I'm Hari Srinivasan. Thanks for watching. Have a good night.